Welcome back to Open to Truth, a podcast all about exploring big ideas and discovering truth together. My name's Clint. Hey, I'm Tony. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to do a mailbag episode. I think it's number four. Yeah, this is, yes, this is number four. In the history of the show. Yeah, we'll be interacting with your comments and questions that you've been sending in over the last, what, couple months or so? Couple months. Um, before we get there, though, a mm. few housekeeping items, ah, if we could hit them. Sure. Uh, one is, I just want our audience to know that as of this week, Clint is actually a doctor. He has defended his dissertation mm. successfully, fended off any criticisms or answered them reasonably enough that they have awarded him the title of doctor. So, henceforth... Dr. Clinton Byron Neptune, congratulations, man. Thank you. Yeah, we're really Appreciate proud of you. It. I know how much work that's been behind the scenes, so yep. it's cool to see you at the finish line. I just uh, made a little uh, social media post last night about it. And oh, awesome. I was thinking about how for years it had this painful, mocking future tense to it, mm. this project. This like, thing hanging over your head. Yeah, it's going to, uh, you need to get it done, but it's not happening now. It's later, 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 one day. Yeah. And now finally, I'm just kind of getting adjusted to, oh, that's past tense. Oh, that's gone now. <laughs> I don't need to like go do that yeah. in the mornings this week. And Oh, I remember just how many times we were working out and what a sense of like just low grade, you ought to be doing this, you ought to be doing this mm -hmm. kind of every day in the background. Tainted all of my fun that I would try to have. Yep. Anytime you open up Valheim, ugh, crushing guilt. <laughs> Think of the time I could spend writing and, instead and of like, building. And likely well justified. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not. <laughs> that might in fact be the Logos just calling you to right, step yeah. into. I'm thankful right for that mechanism of guilt. And, yeah. Uh, but. Yeah. So I just wanted our audience to know that. So yeah. Uh, super proud of you, man. The other thing I wanted to check in on was because, you know, I've had a baby, you guys heard a few episodes ago. So you and I haven't sat down to record in like a month, actually, yeah. I think, since mm -hmm. he arrived. So I want to check in with a deal that we made yes. before baby was born about what we would be eating in the month of October. Mm -hmm. And I think your claim was, was it one day a week you won't yes. eat meat? That occurred. Did it occur? I did that. Was it the same day every week? No. You flexed it. I did. Depending on the needs. Mm -hmm. And how's it been for you? Um, it wasn't very good. Like, it wasn't very enjoyable or... I don't, I just not didn't. Not very transformative. You it was not very transformative. You didn't feel the impact of it. No. I mean, I did it in a really kind of squirrely way. You, what'd you do? Well, just like I went to Taco Bell and had bean burritos. So it's almost like meat. It's still fast food. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a yeah, cheat fast meal. So, which like on a veganist's view. It's I mean, better than meat. No, it's better. It you is did a some better moral thing. improvement. Yeah. <laughs> but you didn't stretch yourself to your limits. I did not know. No. Like, I only had a few vegetables in the past month. I couldn't even tell you when, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, so so how do you feel heading into November? Here we are at the end of October. Are you going to amend this or are you, you going to drop it? Because my thinking is, if you take on too little of a challenge, it feels like, what's the point? It's like, okay, well, one day a week, I'll just go get my bean burritos. I right. might as well not be doing this. Yeah, yeah. It's not actually shaping me morally. It just mm -hmm. feels like a chore I'm doing for the podcast. Yeah, like right? I had a, I had eggs and toast in the morning. I don't always have lunch. Yeah. And then I just slammed a bunch of bean burritos at, in dinner, and that was it. And then patted yourself on the back. I did it. it yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which still, both of those included on, like, on a vegan view. It's still horrible. You got egg. cheese in there. You got eggs in there. You still haven't really helped the animals. No. No. Okay, well, I appreciate your honesty there. It's been pretty bust for me as well because like month of October has been meal train month. Now, I will say when people have reached out and said, what do you prefer to eat? Mm. Or what would we like to make you? Are you vegetarian? I had somebody ask me, are you eating meat these days? And I said, actually, no, I'm trying not to. And so they made me some really yummy like stuffed butternut squash or something, v vegan meals, vegetarian meals. So I... I, where I could, I opted for veggie options. Mm. I ate more salad than I normally do. Mm. Normally would say no to a salad, but several times I thought, yes, I will eat my salad here. Mm -hmm. But I mean, a lot of these meal train meals still had meat in them. So I was having sausage and yeah. quiches and egg bakes and mm -hmm. whatever else. So I don't feel like, like you, I don't feel that I really felt the impact of the challenge. And I will probably re-up for November where there is no meal train. And my commitment was... Five days a week, I won't eat meat. Jeez, man. Two okay. days, I will allow myself if okay. I feel the need. 
Well, allow me then to, uh, I'll check in with you at yes. the end of November. Please, please see. do. Yeah. <laughs> Hold me to it. So November should prove hopefully more challenging for me than October did. Mm-hmm. So I bring that up. We are doing a mailbag episode. And I think one of our questions is related to our animal rights episode. Yes. You did not include mm. Brad's email. I didn't. Oh, when you texted that, I didn't know what you were talking about. You didn't see that? No. Oh, Brad wrote us like a massive email oh, dang. in response to our animal rights uh, or should you eat meat episode. And rather than I don't respond, know, I don't know where that was. I don't know. Oh, well, maybe I'll, it's just to you. I'll pull it up and read it later then. Okay. Because I do think it's worth hearing. He's got some good thoughts. Yeah. That's my brother, by the way. He's been vegan for the last, I don't know, few years. So he just knows more about the space than I do. Yeah, yeah. And it'd be good to hear some of his okay. comments. For so. sure. Yeah, we can pull that up in a minute. Or you can get that going and All I'll right. jump us off here. All right. uh, so question number one from Renee is, uh, why don't we pray for Satan? I have. <laughs> Okay. So <laughs> yeah, well, maybe the problem's can, with you, Renee. <laughs> can you say <laughs> Can you say more? What do you mean? Well, what did you pray for? Yeah, so that's interesting, man. Um, like I've said in previous podcasts, my theological journey has really spanned the whole spectrum. Like if there's a if there's a corner of Christianity, I've probably dwelt in that corner for a brief moment of time, mm-hmm. trying on those lenses and seeing how it fits. So at least at one point, um it's and it might have been when I was reading some more of this Greg Boyd stuff. And and certainly as my mm. mind was opening to the possibility of universal salvation, that maybe in the end, God does in fact redeem everybody, every being. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as I got to thinking about that, I was like, well, I can't imagine that God hates something that he's created. And in this world where I still subscribed to a, a <clears throat> real personality of Satan, and we can talk we probably would need to talk yeah. more about what Let's exactly. just assume it is for now. Let's but, assume that. Okay. Then I thought, well, maybe God has love for this being and it breaks his heart that he's rebelled and, and that Satan so hates God. Because that's the story, right? Is Satan was the chief, one of the archangels who leads worship, wanted to be like God. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lucifer. Lucifer, yeah. And then God said, mate, you're not going to be like me. You're created. And he said, well, I'm out of here then. Mm-hmm. Took, what, a third of the angels with him? That's right. And they fled to the underworld or the earth where they roam around um, and they're trying to Was it undermine a third or God's... two thirds? He has less. I feel like he has less. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he has one third and then he and his army of rebel angels are seeking to undermine God's plans and purposes, especially for believers, try to prevent people Prowling coming to around the... like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Yep. So, um, yeah, anyway, as I was thinking down the lines of some of this universal salvation stuff, I did at several times pray for Satan. I was like, well, if there's any chance that mm-hmm. that he could turn and actually like be on team Jesus, that'd be awesome. <laughs> if we could, if we could have Satan and his demons yeah. do the flip back. It's a, to me, it's brilliant. A, like, obviously there is something kind of t- funny about it in a way, like, mm-hmm. but it's complicated. Like it involves some heavy theological matters. Yeah. Not the least of which is just the efficacy of prayer. Mm-hmm. And like, why think that your prayer, little Tony Ooh. Allen, would affect the fate of yeah. such a cosmic type of being? Right. You know. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Change God's mind about Satan in that. But we humble are talk- moment. Well, here's maybe the other way I thought about it was the instruction from Jesus is pray for your enemies, pray for those who curse you, or bless those who curse you, love your enemies. And I thought, well, if we take that to the extreme. We talk all the time in church about the enemy, the enemy. That's Satan, right? Mm-hmm. I was like, well, if I'm supposed to love my enemies, then maybe I am supposed to love Satan too, which is weird to say and weird to do. Weird. Mm-hmm. I don't even know how you do it, really. Weird to sing about it. Weird to, we sing we love the you, Satan. opposite sometimes. Satan, we love you. <laughs> yeah, that's not... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't. Yeah, you can't do that. You can't. You can't we talk about him being defeated and... I know. Stomped on and but imagine, head crushed. I know. There's a lot. <laughs> See? Yeah. Right. We. It's like we need a villain. That's how it comes across is like mm-hmm. for there to be a champion and a hero of Jesus, the ultimate good guy, you need the ultimate bad guy as well in Satan, just as a contrast almost. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to say, couldn't you want good for Satan? If that's what love is, if that's what we mean by love, to desire the best for them. <clears throat> I think like the orthodox like meaning like the right thinking mm-hmm. on this from like the evangelical perspective would be 
you wouldn't because God has already made up his mind. We see that in scripture that Satan is fated to this eternal doom. Right. Alongside so, the reprobate. So in in so places like Revelation or whatever, we are seeing we're seeing your, how it's gonna play out. Right. Don't get your britches in a bunch yeah. over a, it's a glass of spilled milk. Done deal. He's gonna end up in the lake of fire. I think that's what nothing to pray about. Said, right? Yeah. Does that strike you as right? That that would be the response? Yes, that it strikes me right as that would be the response. Right. I don't know if it strikes me as right. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, hope that helps. Uh, feel free, I guess, my suggestion. is um, What, feel free to pray for him? Sure. It can't hurt, right? Yeah. It's not going to hurt. It might tick him off. Right. He might not <laughs> In, like invite that. Invite yeah. extra horrors upon your life. Uh, how dare you? Okay. I don't know. Interesting question there. Uh, this fellow, uh, goes by his YouTube handle. Okay. Didn't want to share his real name. That's okay. okay. That's all right. Uh, morality without addiction is his handle. Uh, all right. Okay. And Good. he's responding to our anti-natalist episode again mm -hmm. for a viewer just tuning in basically the view that it's morally wrong to procreate yeah. and have children. And I was so surprised if you haven't watched that episode, you can go and watch it. I was so surprised the response we got. That yeah. episode it really seemed like we poked a hornet's nest. It's our there. most watched episode. Yeah, that doesn't have a guest. Right, it's just us spitballing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but it got uh, a reaction. So yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of comments. Okay, uh, but this was a uh, not just this wasn't a YouTube comment. He uh, wrote in. To the oh, awesome! To Thanks the mail for taking the time to do that. To dude. the mailbag, uh, and there was a whole paragraph of stuff. But I thought this was like a key point that I wanted to dis to discuss. Yeah. And his basic general moral principle is like, hey, if you can't get consent, don't do that thing. So in the case of a possible future child, it's impossible for you to acquire that consent to be born mm -hmm. uh, ahead of it being born. How, how so do not do it. By definition. Yeah. General moral principle that is then being applied to this case. I'm really curious, and I'm not trying to be like a dick or split hairs or anything. I'm just curious how that plays out in the rest of life. Like how how far do you take that idea of consent? Is there such a thing ever as implied consent? Do you need explicit consent? And here's where I'm thinking like my, all of my actions eventually are impacting other people. It's mm -hmm. tough for me to act in any way in the world and have it not at some point affect another person. But I'm not asking for consent for almost anything that I do. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, and just to be super clear, this might be an annoying philosopher's distinction. What he literally said is, if you can't get consent, don't do it. That's different from if you don't get consent, uh, don't do it. Sure. And I wonder if he does mean the second one, but the, the first, what he actually has, is kind of a strange, just the impossibility of consent at all. Means don't do it or on the side of not acting well because like i'm just wondering is this uh, let's say i wanted to spray paint the lincoln memorial mm -hmm. something lewd on there um i can't get lincoln's consent or or how, how about this um we're not spray painting we're tearing it down to build um a big orphanage yep. so something good yeah okay. sure okay not vandalism. Okay. Presumably that he might even be in favor of. Yeah. But I can't get the consent of that. So yeah. don't do it. So don't do it. I don't know. There's, I think there's, it gets you into strange territory. The other thing that came to mind was I, I'm imagining a medical situation where somebody slips into unconsciousness, doesn't have a DNR, hasn't really mm. thought about it at all. It's sudden. Should you revive them? Should you let them go? I can't ask for consent. But in the, even in that case, it's like, I can't ask for consent to revive them, so I shouldn't. Or, I can't ask for consent to let them go, so I shouldn't. I don't know how it helps guide your actions in that situation. Mm, interesting. Consent to do what? Consent to intervene, I guess, is really what you would be yeah. wanting. But I would think you probably should revive them if you can, but you won't have their consent. Not the explicit, yeah. Not the and then explicit. you get into like, is there presumed consent? Once they're alive, mm -hmm. you could expect someone to have a, you... To be grateful for Everyone is walking around with the presumed consent. If it's an easy save, Please save, save me. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but 
and this is easy for me to say because I exist, if uh, I feel like that same argument might apply to an unborn person, that like most people, am I crazy here? Most people are glad they were born or not? What do we think? I don't know. I mean, I mean, oh, we'd well, be I totally I, making it as up. As in, I'm not certain. But. but in that same sense that you're saying, people walk around with a general sense of like, hey, if it's an easy save to save me, I'd like to keep living. I think most people. I feel that way about life in general. If it's easy to bring me into the world, thanks. Bring mm -hmm. me into the world. I'd like to be a part of existence and what's happening. Right. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, and it's kind of interesting too that it's a, typically framed as like, don't do bad things. Mm. But just as this is, if you can't get consent, don't do it. What about good things? And this we brought would up. Would it in the be? Episode. Would I have violated the consent of my neighbor by dropping in a million dollar check in their mailbox mm -hmm. without? I didn't ask them ahead of time. Didn't ask them to do it. Did I do wrong by them? I mean, yeah, I didn't acquire the consent. So, like to map that on to the antinatalist case, uh, that's one thing I found throughout the comments. Just a little bit bizarre is the uh, constant focus on the the possible harms that will befall the person that ensues without acknowledgement of the possible goods yeah 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 i think we commented on that mm -hmm. in the episode that you need to take both into account mm -hmm. and, and it's not obvious to me that one outweighs the other or it's certainly not obvious to me that the bad outweighs the good mm -hmm. but i i'm i'm interacting with this comment based on one sentence you said he wrote a whole email so maybe yeah. i should read that whole thing I want to treat treat it fairly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can send it to you. Yeah. But that's, yeah. I mean, I think that's, it's a fair, he he pointed me to look at the Wikipedia article on antinatalism. Okay. And there's a subheading, impossibility of consent. Mm -hmm. It's like, go read that. That's a better description of what I'm talking about. Okay. It's, yeah, it's that idea. Yeah, okay. So, right. the, the merit, let's just maybe enclose, the merit of it depends on just the strength of that as a general moral principle. Yeah. If there are good counterexamples to it where it doesn't hold up, yeah. then it should be discarded as a moral principle. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, this is actually from my daughter. Oh, okay. Uh, she asked me this months ago, and I'm like, I'm going to put that on the next mailbag just because it's kind of cute and interesting. All right, let's see it. Uh, she asked, is God rich or poor? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is God rich or poor? Uh, I, d I guess I don't quite know how to answer that. <laughs> so if you believe Jesus is God, he was poor. I, I think so, right? Yeah. yeah. He had his needs cared for. Yeah, he had a I little... I heard some things about like he has the purple robe or something and that was like an expensive item that may have been given to him. When did he have a purple robe? Isn't that like his garment? Oh, oh, um, the, um, sorry, not the, that's more of like a, I guess an iconography. Yeah, that's an image but the, of royalty. Um, like they were casting lots for his garments. Oh, like they were valuable. Oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, I thought they were valuable in the sense that a meme is valuable, and it was kind of a memey thing that was happening with this celebrity figure is being crucified, mm. and his clothes will be valuable for that. I think reason. I've heard some scholars say like it's because he had like he had some nice stuff. Man, that's interesting. I've yeah. never. I always picture Jesus and like not having ratty nice stuff. Oh, well, he says he's got no homes. He's at least itinerant and homeless. Mm -hmm. So he's couch surfing. Uh, it doesn't list. It doesn't talk about him having many possessions. He tells his disciples not to have many. Take your clothes and your sandals and your yeah. bag or whatever with you. Mm -hmm. That's about it. So at least we don't see opulence in Jesus' life, right. living in a some grand temple or whatever. But in the sense that God is created everything, <laughs> say like, well. Anything that is, is part of his domain, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, as the psalmist puts it. Ah. I think the psalmist, maybe that's someone else. But so in that sense, like, well, the whole cosmos is his, the whole earth and its contents, it's all his, mm -hmm. rich and poor, which I think is, I don't know. I think both people who are poor and people who have extreme wealth will find that um, relationship with God is possible and one doesn't exclude them from knowing him. Does that make sense? Like, sure. I want to say he's equally accessible and understandable by both the rich and the poor because he sort of inhabits both spaces. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, I don't know if that's yeah, making no, much that's sense. Fair. But 
Yeah. Yeah. I think depending on how you look at it. What, what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Which person of Trinity, maybe. Uh, yeah. Um <clears throat> Okay, this is from Mesa. Uh why does this is totally switching gears. Okay. Why does no one ever address the monopoly over or sorry. Why does no one ever address the monopoly our own government has on our understanding of the universe? Uh, young Earth creationism wouldn't seem to have as big of a problem with secular science if government and public education didn't force evolution onto us. Hmm. Well, I guess I don't think the government does have a monopoly on our understanding of the universe. Are we? Are, does was it Mesa? She? I don't I know. That's Just a she Mesa. I don't know if it's a she or a he. I'm gonna. In my mind, you're a woman. Sorry okay. if you're not. But uh, does she mean because in public schools creationism isn't taught? I do think that's that. what she means. Mm -hmm. I feel like these days in 2021, with the internet and what is happening with education, the idea of a monopoly on information is. I don't understand really what that means. Like there's so many ideas that we're all exposed to online that what I hear about in the classroom is just one sliver of mm -hmm. possible <clears throat> views I could go and research. So it's not as though I'm being, it's not as though we're being censored. Like the government is censoring your access to in uh, alternate theories of the origins of the universe or whatever. Like maybe that would happen in some countries, but it's not happening here in the U S right. Maybe like the just the authority figure of the teacher isn't giving equal airtime mm. to your pet theory, let's say, mm -hmm. and so it's just giving you the evolution story. And what what is the actual question? What do we make of it? Oh, just why does no one ever address it? Oh, the monopoly our own government has on our understanding of the universe. Yeah, I think you're spot on. Mm. Just in the it, um in the internet age. Well, and it kind of gets to maybe to like just to dig a little bit deeper into the question, just what's the government's role in education at all? Yeah. Why, why even think that there's a connection there? There's mm -hmm. this old, it's kind of fallen out of fashion, but this Latin phrase in loco parentis mm. was the guiding light for public education locally in place of parents. Right. So like the authority used to be community, like, very local, very communal, and the parents in that community would collectively decide what they want to be taught in the schools. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, it was very decentralized. Then government doesn't really have a monopoly. I mean, it's funded by the state. Mm -hmm. It's still public, you know, and your tax dollars, and or maybe not even federally, your local government yep. property tax would go to support the school. Um, but now there's more the sense that it's guild directed or institutionally directed. So mm. like these big science organizations like the National Institute of Science Education would be crafting materials and suggesting to now federally funded public school systems, mm. this is the curriculum you have to use. Right. And so I do see in that sense, like there is, there's been a shift since the origin of U.S. public education away from community driven toward guild or institution driven is that concerning as someone who is <clears throat> liberty yeah uh, liberty, liberty loving yeah do you consider that to be an overreach would you prefer a more community driven curriculum i would yeah, yeah. now if i don't know if you, i had not done this before but i've never been to a school board meeting and this is where like you we still elect where you get to voice your Concern. Yeah. And I watched one on YouTube in for Medina yeah. that took place in September and okay. I, they put it online. So anyone could go watch it. Live or after the fact? It so was after the fact. Okay. And it's it's just completely outrageous, man. It's it's a hoot. Why? Even just watch it for fifteen minutes. I mean, they are screaming at these people. You don't deserve to be we're gonna vote you out. You really? Should, you don't you don't have the right to tell us to wear masks and all this stuff. And just like and really both views are Whoa. Um, and they're talking over each other. It's just a complete cluster. It's not moderated? It's just it's a uh, I mean you can try. I mean they're trying like uh please Sir, your time has expired. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Huh. So that 
that does um, make me worried a little bit about the communal level driven. If that's what it just looks like. Because it was, there was just some total goobers yeah, out there. Yeah, you don't want their voice, really. <laughs> but really what I mean by that is um, they're voting. I mean, I guess this, I like how the system is set up, I guess, where you have a local or county school board that you would vote for. And maybe they would have more of a hand in designing the curriculum. Mm. Um, and it wouldn't be as federally or state level mandated. The local, right. the better. I do generally agree with that. Um, local, the better. And 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 so the guilds come in where, like, if you do like trust the guilds, which I don't, I'm not saying that that's wrong to do. Like, they're professional scientists and mm -hmm. educators. That the people in the community can vote for school board members who subscribe to this guild. Yeah. And if the if the body populace wants that, then that's what's in the school. Yeah. Now you get the case of where, like, if it's a total backwater place and um, we're not going to, I don't know, teach anything about evolution at all. And so you get a whole crop of kids coming out of that county where there's no, it's just Bible science. Yeah. You know, and they, in their science class, all it was was the days of creation. And yeah, I don't know. I could see that being an issue too, yeah. but. So I think okay. I kind of get the concern behind there, but as far as the monopoly, I don't think we're there at least yeah. anymore. Right, right. In the internet age. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Oh, yep. Nice Uh Now this is Mona, different Mona, person. Okay. <clears throat> How do you have a relationship with Jesus when He's not there? Mm. I really want to hear God like a conversation. I'm not sure if the thoughts I have are a conversation with Jesus or if it's just me talking to myself. Oh man. Yeah. Really good question. Mm -hmm. so it should be really, f honestly, that should be a question you hear more often, given how much we as a church and as capital C church talk about yeah. relationship with Jesus. Go talk with God about it. Go talk, see what Jesus says about that. Man. What's if you, God saying to you? If you are on the outside looking in, yeah, it does seem pretty insane. Especially given that the level of skepticism I often feel when somebody tells me God told me to do X, mm -hmm. red flags immediately. And I'm someone who believes in God and believes that I communicate with God as well. So, um, but I'm very skeptical of everyone else's experience. Yeah, yeah. And I think I'm skeptical of my own at times. I, I, certainly that's a question I've thought about a lot. It's like, man, is this just me or is there something going on here? What has, what's your experience been personally having you've been in around the church in Christendom 30 something years now has your experience of the what it's like to relate to God changed throughout that time hmm. the texture of it of the experience uh I don't know. Actually, I think the best I'm coming up with now is there. I've detected a change in just my own emotion about it. Mm. But I, when I reflect on the actual texture of what it seems like, I don't think so. I used to be a lot more afraid. Um, more or and, afraid of what? And cautious of what God thought of me or what my oh. fate would be. Yep. How about um, in terms of thinking that you've heard something from God, are you more or less skeptical of that than you used to be? I am less skeptical of that. You're, you're more, you'll more quickly go. Yeah. God's telling me to do X, Y, Z. I think so. Yeah. I'm, how about this? I'm more comfortable with the idea that it's both me thinking it and God saying it yeah, to me. Yeah, interesting. Can you say more about that? There's this, um, I like this uh, chapter. It's toward the end of the Deathly Hollows, mm. the final book of the Harry Potter series. Um, spoiler alert, I guess. It's been out for a while. But um, Harry goes to confront Voldemort at the end. He's got the three Deathly Hollows. He has the Resurrection Stone. Oh, he's got the stone. Yeah. yeah. And he's just found out he's the final Horcrux. <laughs> this is the last, um, this is the what. If Voldemort's going to be defeated, Harry has to die. Yeah. So he confronts him. Uh, Voldemort does the Avada Kedavra, and immediately he's <laughs> transported to uh, King's Cross Station, yeah, which is I, a I place in the book and in real life, right? Yep. yep. 
and it's kind of ethereal looking and it's all white and Harry's just kind of like, what's going on here? Where am I? He walks over and sees this crumpled little grotesque, like naked baby on the ground. Like yeah. a, it looks like an old dead shriveled little, golem type yeah, thing. And that's supposed to be Voldemort. Mm -hmm. And he has this conversation with, I almost said Gandalf, same guy basically, yeah, Dumb, it Dumbledore. Just, it's Gandalf. Who has since deceased and he's, you know, this is part of this vision or whatever he's having. And at the end he says, uh, Gandalf is, it's like not Gandalf. Or, but sorry, or, or, <laughs> it's exactly the same idea, though. It is the Eye of the King. It's the same idea. Dumbledore, is any of this real, or is it just going on in my head? And yeah. he says, "Oh, Harry, of course it's going on in your head. But yeah. why ever think that, that doesn't mean it's real? Where else could it be going on?" Yeah, and I've just—I don't know. I found that like a useful heuristic to thinking about. Mm -hmm. Like, just because something is a mental activity in my mind, mm -hmm. does not mean that there isn't divine activity taking place exactly in the same way. Yeah. Uh, from Proverbs, there is the little line, uh, a man plans his own way and the Lord directs his steps. Mm -hmm. It's kind of both things happening at the same time. Of course, I do think that not all of my thoughts are laced with the divine. Divinely Surely. inspired. No. Yeah. I don't think so, but... There can, I don't know, there's just this texture to it where um, I am thinking it, like, I can't, uh, if it's before my mind, of course it's me in some way entertaining it. Yeah. Right? right. You know what I mean? Like, it's part of my yeah, yeah. conscious experience. And but only some, your conscious experience. So yeah. it always has that, but sometimes there's this extra little texture to it that, like, I don't, it doesn't seem like it originated from me or like mm. a... a um, a thought was given to me or uh, has this, uh, yeah, it has this marking of the divine in it. I don't, it's hard to explain. Do, but. is it, um, do you treat it differently than you treat your conscience or are they sort of the one I do the think same of thing? that the same. You think of them as the same thing. I do. So, so it carries with it some, um, ought, some moral weight to it. Yeah. An example I'll give all the time is, um, like saying, something nice to the lady checking me out at speedway sure handling che my and transaction when you say checking you out handling you my transaction yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah so i don't i don't always do that like as a matter of principle and, mm -hmm. and maybe some people do and that's nice for them but sometimes i feel this urge to like you should ask about how their day is going mm -hmm. and it just doesn't feel, that's not a normal clinton habit and and maybe and like I get that an atheist or agnostic would say like oh yeah that's just arising out of your subconscious from time to time mm -hmm. maybe you ate something different that day or some something happened to where that came up in your mental stream of consciousness mm -hmm. okay fine but in my worldview I think that their God exists and cares about the ways of the world and wants it to go better in certain and that if I can yeah. that he, he acts through people mm -hmm. right so. If he was going to, I don't know, yeah, act in that situation, this is how it would happen. It would be, it would be through your inner experience of having a thought that carries with it some moral weight or some ought with it, and then you act on it. Um, because I mean, you might say like, well, isn't it just always good to be say nice stuff to the late? Ah, uh, I get what you mean, but maybe not. Like some people are just. Like, dude, if the next person tries to talk to me, I'm just going to flip out, dude. Yeah. And everyone just come in, buy your shit and yeah. leave, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could see that being, and so like, maybe it wouldn't be good yep. to like engage with that person. I find in my experience, um, sometimes it's a thought like I ought to go and do this thing and it is out of my comfort zone. It's like, man, if I had my druthers, I wouldn't mm -hmm. go over and talk to that person and ask them how they're doing, something like that. And it's like, man, if it was up to me, I don't want to because I know that person or I know what that conversation is going to be like, whatever it happens to be. But I err on the side of, it's kind of like, well, it could just be me thinking I should go and do this thing. Or it could be that God's wanting to do something here. Better for me to err on the side of making myself available for hmm. that. I think more often, I don't know if this is true of your experience as well, more often I'm hearing... Uh, hearing a little warning of when I should not do things. Oh. Pause. 
don't do that. Uh, this would be a mistake. Don't do it. You know, mm -hmm. which again is a voice of conscience. We could call that my conscience. Yeah. But why do I have a conscience? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm more often hearing that than I think I am the prescriptive go and do X, Y, Z. I have never had, have you ever had an audible voice? I mean, some people claim this. No. I've never heard an audible voice. And so it does have the texture of a thought mm -hmm. um, as part of my inner experience. I've also had, and again, I don't know if this is so much hearing God speak as it is what I might think of as being like a, an encounter with or like the presence of God maybe. But I've had these moments, and I think you have too, of, oh boy, they're actually hard to describe, but um, something of, about them feels weighty and you are then there's a clarity of presence in a way that there normally isn't. I remember you describing one time you maybe were just going in and checking on Hannah at night or one of your kids or something. Mm. And you had a really sort of profound spiritual experience there. And I, I feel like I have those on occasion as well, where mm -hmm. I'm, I'm overwhelmed with whether it's gratitude for my life and the way it is, or, or it's sort of, it's made obvious to me in a way that it's, not at all hours of the day how blessed I am and how beautiful all of this is, the gift that life itself is. It's almost like a peeking through the veil on occasion that mm -hmm. happens, a parting of the right, veil. Right. Um, and so that feels less like God saying something and more like God winking at me or something. But um, yeah, that's just from my own personal experience. That's what my relationship with God feels like. So when I think about a relationship with Jesus, I don't see him. I don't see a man called Jesus with a beard. I don't hear an audible voice. No. Um, which is why, can we go there? Who cares? I'm just going to talk. And if we need to edit stuff out because it's heresy, then it will be. But that's why I am I am he hesitant to talk that much about Jesus as being the God that I'm having the relationship with. Mm. Jesus was a man who lived you know, 2,000 years ago. Yeah. I believe he revealed God's nature. I believe he was... I believe he was in a unique way representative of God and and uh, united to God. But is it Jesus that I'm talking to today? Or is it this same one God that has always been that we have a bunch of different names for? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Like you, the idea there being like maybe a different version of Trinity almost. Yeah. Like less that there are unique persons, but more like modes of one. Yeah, yeah, right. Or even, and this is maybe being, maybe it's semantics and being a stickler, but even then the Trinity isn't Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. It's Father, Christ, Holy Spirit. There's right. this yeah, Christ man. that's worth talking about. If, if Trinity is worth talking about, then it's not Jesus that is the second person of the Trinity. It's mm -hmm. Christ. And this is why you see guys like, like Paul basically never talks about Jesus in his writing. He's always talking about Christ. I think he only mentions Jesus three times in all of his letters. Mm. Everything else is Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. So who is Christ? What is Christ? I am more inclined to say it's Christ that I'm interacting with than it is Jesus. Just because I think what we mean by Jesus is flesh and blood, bone with a beard, hair, a guy, a human guy. And I have not interacted with a human guy called Jesus. And see, what's interesting, like, I think there there may have been a few years there where my prayers would have been Jesus centric mm. prayer life, but uh, I think for a long time it was Father, mm -hmm. a little bit of Jesus, and then in adulthood, almost entirely like I frequently pray to the Holy Spirit. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, most of my prayers on Sunday morning, like to the congregation, if I have the opportunity yeah, you to preach, do too. I address the Holy Spirit almost every time. So say more about that. Why? Uh, I think similar, like for similar reasons to you, that that's kind of who I think is. <laughs> I mean, operating. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Less so, Jesus of Nazareth. More so, like the Holy Spirit. That's the Paraclete. That's the Comforter yeah. who was sent to help me out with yes. stuff. So I'm gonna pray to him. So as far as what does it mean to Go have ahead. a relationship with Jesus? I I do think. It, well, this isn't again. I do think it's shorthand for just God, I guess. Right. Yeah. That's, that's how you have to come to understand it. Cause we can't literally mean invite Jesus into your heart. You can't mean that 
because Jesus is a, a human person. Right. Right. You can't fit a grown man into your heart. Can't yeah. do it. So mm. that's not what we mean. We mean the God revealed in Jesus. Uh, we want him to unite with our spirit in some way, communicate to my internal life and my world, you know, like mm -hmm. permeate my inner experience. All of that I'm fine with. But I think the language can be confusing. Well, Trinity, I mean, I am, <clears throat> I rarely, rarely kick things to mystery. Yeah, I know. And mysticism. I know you hate it. I would much prefer to find a rational answer. And if things are contradictory, then it's not mysterious. Like right. that's just wrong. <laughs> I don't find Trinity contradictory, uh -huh. but it is very, very mysterious. Yes. So I think like if someone is upset by what we're saying right now and think it's heretical, I think you're just not appreciating how mysterious Trinity is. Like Tony and I are talking more about the unified part of Trinity, mm -hmm. and maybe you would prefer to stress the differences. The so. yeah, the th the threeness of Trinity. Yeah, but it is it's a little bit strange when we get into the t like you can you can pray to God, Father, you could pray to Christ, or you could pray to Holy Spirit. Yeah, as though they're three entirely different and that folks. There's, there's way that you should do it. Like you pray to the Father through the Son. By the spirit, I've heard people say. I can't even handle that one right now. That sounds <laughs> that's wild. That's how you're supposed to do it. And I I mean, godly men and women have put a lot of thought into this. It's not they're not just making stuff up. They're mm -hmm. they're trying to properly relate to this God that is somehow relationship. We're dovetailing here into Trinity and why that's important at all. But I think the strongest argument I can think of for why our God would be triune and why that is like central is because if it is and maybe this is Plantingen, uh, that if it is in God's nature to be love, love is necessarily a relational term and there needs to be some sort of eternal mm. relationship that's going on. Um, so you can't just have one person. If relationships are interpersonal, you need multiple persons. But to your point, it is a mystery what we mean by three persons, one God. Mm -hmm. And in a way that does not mean three gods, we're not talking about polytheism. No. And I, and frankly, like in my, I think there might be some like confusion or hypocriticalness in how I speak about it or prayer. And I, forgive me if that happens. Oh, yeah. But like, I know there are times when it does, I've treated it polytheistically. Mm -hmm. Just because it's easier to make sense of. Yeah. I don't, I don't actually think that. That's mm -hmm. not my theology. But like when I pray to the Holy Spirit, it's, I just had to remember, like, oh, that is the same being as the Father and Christ. Yeah. It's a different person. It's Interesting. Just, I'm much more likely to think of it, I'm going to say this wrong, in a, well, I guess in a unitary way, than I am in a polytheistic way. I'm more, more likely to think there's one God who shows up in different ways at different times. Mm -hmm. And so we've developed a bunch of names for those different ways and different times. But it's really one one being. Yeah, for sure. That's very so, much like I, Jerzak and Paul mm -hmm. Young and the but Shack. It's but formally, that's heresy, right? That's modalism. That's, mod yeah, that's so, modalism. <laughs> so that's heresy. But it's, I think it makes more sense. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I think when you press most people to describe Trinity, they end up describing modalism. I think it is the more common view, yeah. like an analogy that it's like ice, water, and steam. And to be sure, and like... All H2O, but different forms. And frankly, like the heresy charge is somewhat frustrating in that it's now has opened up a whole other area like the reason it's heresy is because there's this text of truths about god that you think you have contradicted mm -hmm. by your statement yeah and so you're of course you're wrong it says it over here yeah and that view of like it says it over here carries with it this whole authoritative uh inerrant inspired whole package of doctrines and i might i'm fine with those terms and using them for like my purposes and and tweaking those but just know that like when you're claiming something's heretical you're bringing to the table this whole other yeah uh bibliology to mm -hmm. it that needs assessed on its own merits as well so you, know? you can see was it mona who asked this question uh this yeah it's mona you can see mona how one simple question has 
led to us pulling threads. Right. And this is just what happens in deconstruction yeah. when you start to ask these questions. Well, what do we really mean by a relationship with Jesus? Mm -hmm. Well, let's try to get clear on that. Well, now we've got to get clear on Trinity. Like, do you need to also have a relationship with the Holy Spirit? Yeah, and, and the Father. Or, and, or are you doing that at the same time? Is it all when you have relation one relationship? It's a good I think question. That, huh? I do think that. You think it's all one relationship? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yes, I do too. I do too. Uh, I, I will say that for years, though, I saw their personalities as different. The Father did... The father's temperament was not the same as Jesus' temperament in my mind for a long time. So the way that I psych psychologically related to the father is different than the way that I related to Christ. Now, like I was saying, I think it's become much more unified in my mind where it's like, yeah, it's one being. Mm -hmm. um, which is, that's which would yeah, be that's, one relationship. It's orthodox. Yes. Yeah, one being. Yeah. So, yeah. It's the three persons part. That's... Yeah. <laughs> Because I also wonder why stop at three. Sure. Maybe there's been more. I don't know. If we're just saying God's revealed, if if we're allowing this modalism thing where it's like, oh, same God shows up in a bunch of different ways. For sure, man. Why stop at three? Yeah. Why not say he's revealed himself? In the bodhisattvas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> right? So, interesting. Well, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we really helped you there or just showed you how complex the landscape can be, but... Appreciate you asking the question and thinking about it. Well, do you want to bookend this with the message yeah, well, from Brad? I'll, I'll just read the email because I can't remember if he had any strong... Que oh, the, really, the only question was how are we doing with our October challenge? But he had some good thoughts that I just want to... Yeah, hit add. us with the highlights. Is it like super long? No, it's not oh, okay. super long. Um, like I said, he's been doing it longer than we have. He's been a vegan, I think, for a few years. And he basically just wanted us to know that... I'll just read this first paragraph because it sums it up. Um, one thing that seemed to pop up a couple of times was that you guys weren't sure of the medical consensus around nutritional value of plant-based diets as compared to diets that included meat. I wasn't sure of this either when I first started, but thankfully there is a decent consensus out there now that plant-based diets are nutritionally adequate for all stages of life, including pregnancy and all stages of childhood. And then he links to the position stated by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And uh, he links that. So I appreciate him linking a source. I know nothing about the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Right. I've never heard of them until this email. So mm -hmm. I am assuming because I trust my brother that they're a trustworthy source. But yeah. uh, it seems like and, and less supplementation than we suspected is necessary. He said B12 and omega-3 are some of the harder ones to get, but it's but you doable. Could, you, there are some foods that are infused with it. Yeah, it's doable. Cereals and walnuts and whatnot. So there you go. Um, okay. any, any thoughts on that? Was was that one of your big concerns with it? The health? It's just not going to be as healthy? I don't think so. You just said That's you're, not a, a, big you're one. a meat addict. You love meat. I think that probably is the heart of it. It's a preference thing, right? Taste, culturally, yeah. texture, behaviorally, smell, all of that. Yeah. I think so. It's weird for me to imagine you as a vegan. What would I eat? Just as I look at you. What is there to have? And just sort of... I mean, it'd be really a, it'd be a Herculean effort. to. I'd have to totally retrain my palate. Yeah. I barely ever have vegetables now. I will gag. Are there any that you if like? If one slips into my mouth, I like a, get it. A, a green pepper or yeah. a, a, a tomato. Are there any that you like? Yeah, I have. I like carrots. I like broccoli. I like asparagus. As, yeah, I grow it and I grow it. You do. You have a lot of asparagus. I grow asparagus, bro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but do you eat it? That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. For those three weeks. Yeah. yeah I <laughs> love it. A little bit expensive. Um, mm. Uh, it's potato. It's more of a starch. I include it. I'll allow You'll it. allow it? I allow I Yeah, that's a vegetable. Uh, just barely. Barely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll have cauliflower when it's kneaded into a dough for cauliflower pizza. Okay. It needs to be presented in form of pizza for you to tolerate it. Okay. <laughs> I love good roasted veggies. Yeah. Some broccoli, cauliflower, a little bit of salt and pepper. Mm, uh, that's good. Sometimes... Some of the exotic ones I found in my Asian stir fries. Oh, I don't know what they are. Like but a water chestnut? Perhaps. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'll choke down a pea every once in a while. What, choking on one pea. It's so <laughs> revolting for you. <laughs> I don't know the last time I had a pea. Green yeah. bean. I'll have a green bean. Okay, you're listing more than I thought you would. It's corn? Really tomatoes and onions you hate. I'll have the ear of corn 
Yeah, you've All done that long day. on the grill. Of course, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll say you're not. It's just leafy greens you're not doing. I You're see, not doing spinach. Oh, I love spinach. Really? Raw spinach in a salad? Absolutely. I used to only have sp- spinach salads. When I did it for like six months, I'd have that every day for lunch. How can you tolerate raw spinach, but you can't tolerate a green pepper? What's going on there? Far more flavor in the green pepper, and the spinach is notoriously no, I do better like when red, it's raw. I do like red and yellow peppers a lot. I'll put that in my... Look at his list is growing. Oh, actually, I do like spinach. But I'm I like just saying, like, I almost never have it. I never ha- All these things I'm mentioning, I almost never have. And Why? That's a good question. If it's not because you don't like them, it's. Um, it is. I just have to go make it. No. I often don't. Effort. So, I, I will say that is the thing. Vegetarian fast food or vegan fast food, very few and far between. Yeah. Good luck. Because if you're in a rush and you need a drive through and you're trying to stick to a vegan diet, your mm-hmm. options are very limited. It's a time thing. So, I, I'm, and this sounds like excuses. I'm it so does. So. It sounds exactly like that. But, it, but I asked for your ex- reasons. Yeah. So, yeah. Just this is what I'm facing when I go home to cook dinner. Like let's say, and and this, I don't know about like I know he said it's okay for kids and stuff. And, yeah. But that's a whole other task of like getting the whole family on board. So let's just say it's me. Yeah. And now I I'm, I'm gonna eat dinner tonight. Well, I could like almost it's gonna take more time to cook the vegetables in addition, or I don't know. I guess in this. What are you it, saying that? It would involve more ingredients. You're asking. So, yeah. I'm not even talking about the vegetarian project. You just asked me how come you don't have vegetables. Yeah. And it is so now where I eat meat plus vegetables in this hypothetical scenario, it's just going to take longer. It's more, more ingredients. More, more dishes are going to be dirtied. So why not just get a little bit of a bigger <laughs> steak? I'm just, I'm just gonna make steak and eat that, and not horse with the vegetables. That's just what man. That's what's been happening that's for the psychology of years. It. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. It's like I. I'm just gonna get more of the good thing. Like that's that's happened before. I'll buy broccoli and it's in the fridge. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make chicken and broccoli. Like, well, actually, I'll just have just another chicken. thing of chicken because it's all, all in the same pan. And that's the good part, and it's easier. Man, and it's not even that I don't like the broccoli. Like, yeah, I will have it. And if it's, someone else, it's if okay. it just if you could Thanos snap it onto your plate. Oh yes, yeah, you have some broccoli. Yes, yes, I would. Yeah. Oh man. So it's these little issues in my way but of course the vegetarian wants me to not have the chicken at all right. and uh, i don't know about i guess i your incentive to eat the broccoli would go up if there were no chicken around because then it's not like well i'll just have another piece of chicken i've got to eat something all i've got is broccoli i guess i'm if that's that broccoli. true but it's rarely it, that's rarely true like we have bread i'll just go have a bite of bread i'll just grab it and then that's just, still easier than broccoli all you're really trying to do is just stave off the hunger pains <laughs> <laughs> like whacking moles oh man oh boy that's tough all right well we'll see how this next month goes yeah. i forget sorry did you amend your challenge i did not okay. no i just said that i would keep you, you honest to your yeah, five you just said that yours didn't prove to be much of a challenge didn't wasn't formative for you and but you'll check in with me yes <laughs> okay. that's what i can do so now. he's got no intent to change his behavior at all <laughs> that's fine okay we'll check back in <clears throat> at the end of the month <laughs> Thanks for writing in, Brad. He might be a lost cause. Is that it? I think that's it. I think that's it. Yep. All right. Well, well thanks for, for joining us for no. a mailbag episode. Uh, as always, if you've got questions, comments, feel free to leave those either on this YouTube video. If you're just listening along, you can write into the show. Mailbag at opentotruth.com. If we interacted with your question today, I hope that we did that in a charitable way. I apologize at all if anything we said or laughed at or something somehow triggered or offended you. It's not our goal. Um, but we would love to hear from you. We, we really like interacting with your thoughts and questions. So that's how you can reach us. What else do they need to know? There's a blog. Yeah, weekly blog. Yeah, uh, sub-, sub to that. Go to opentotruth.com slash subscribe. You'll yeah. see all the stuff there. Even if you just went to opentotruth.com, you'd see... A fun little video. you see a blog beginning. option there. Yeah. Like, you'll figure it out. You're smart. All right. We'll see you next time. Stay curious. <laughs>